much like to hear the reason behind uh, the names that uh, parents choose to call their children. Sometimes those names are deeply personal. Sometimes they reflect a hope that the parents have for those children. And sometimes the parents just have to compromise because they can't agree on the name, so they choose a name that neither one of them loves. So my name is Ben, and my brother's name is Joe. I often tell people that the reason why we're Ben and Joe is because my parents were big fans of Bonanza. <laughs> Some of you are going, I know what you mean by that, the Cartwrights. Other ones are like, I have no idea what he's talking about right now. It's a generational thing, okay? But in reality, my father actually wanted to name me after his favorite writer. His favorite writer was a man named Ambrose uh, Bierce. Yeah, he wanted to name me after Ambrose Pierce, and so he wanted to name me Ambrose. My mom said, uh, no, <laughs> we're not going to name him Ambrose, okay? So they, they compromised. They compromised on a name that both of them kind of liked, so they named me after Benjamin Franklin and named me Benjamin, but my middle name is Ambrose, okay? I actually like the name Ambrose. Now, I wouldn't have liked it when I was a kid, though, okay? Uh, so my kids are named after people in the Bible. April and I decided that when we started having kids that we wanted to name them off of some of our favorite people in the Bible. And so we started with Phoebe. Phoebe was a woman who, according to Paul, served the church in Rome. And she was one of the, we often believe that she's one of the first what was called deaconesses in that time as a servant in the church of Rome. So we pray that Phoebe would be a woman who would likewise serve the church of God as she grows. Isaac was actually named after Abraham's son, Isaac, and it means laughter. And the reason behind that is because April actually tricked me. I was in bed sick one day, and she came home, and this was, uh, this was 16 months after we had had uh, Phoebe, and she, she came home, and she's giving me this whole, was it less than that? It was nine months. Nine months after we had just had Phoebe, and she came, and she sat on the bed, and she said, she gave me this whole list of all the things that she did today, that day, and then she added in there, oh, and I found out I was pregnant, and then she continued on. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm no scientist, but I know that a woman cannot have a baby or be pregnant nine months after she had another baby. Turns out, I was wrong. <laughs> Because a week later she goes, uh, honey, I am pregnant and I'm not joking this time. And I was like, okay, you're playing this joke out a lot longer than I expected. So I actually, we went down to the pregnancy center and got a test just so she could prove to me that she actually was pregnant. So we thought it would be fitting to call him laughter. And that works out really well because if you know Isaac, Isaac likes to bring people laughter, doesn't he? Yeah. Lydia was named for a woman from Thyatira who Paul connected with when he was in Philippi. She would become the first convert to Christianity on the European continent, plus she would open up her door to Paul and his companions, showing great hospitality. So our prayer for, for Lydia has always been that she would be somebody who would not only bring God's word to people, but she would also be somebody who would show great hospitality. And then finally, Elizabeth was named after Mary's relative, Elizabeth, who showed incredible faith and resilience in the face of very trying times. Additionally, she would care for Mary uh, when others would have rejected and ridiculed and judged Mary. Understanding that God was at work in Mary's life through the son that she cared. So we pray that, that Elizabeth would grow in her faith and her resilience, but that she would also continue to develop a heart that cares so much for people. Now in the Old Testament, Hebrew names always had a deep meaning to those who would name them. And they took very, very care in choosing what name they would call it. Most of those names would be focused on what God had done, what God was doing, or what they believed God would do in the future. They were a constant reminder that the one true God was continually involved in the life of his people. This morning we're going to continue our study looking at the life of Joseph, and we're going to be introduced very briefly to Joseph's sons, and we're going to learn a little bit about how their names point to God's goodness and provision in Joseph's life. But in finding that out, we're also going to see what that tells us about what we need to see when we think about what God has done in our life. 
So turn with me if you haven't already in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, there are Bibles in the, uh, the seat pocket in front of you, and you're welcome to use one of those. And if you don't have one, go ahead and take one of those with you so that you can read the Bible for yourself. Genesis chapter 41, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week in Genesis 41, verse uh, 41. What it says in Genesis 41, starting in verse 41, it says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set over, I set you over all of the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot, and he called out before him, Bow the knee. Then he set him over all of the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh called Joseph's name uh, Zaphonath Pen uh, uh, Penea, uh, and he gave him uh, gave into him into marriage uh, Asaniah, uh, uh, daughter of Pophorea, uh, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. So what we see here, uh, right at the beginning of this, is that Pharaoh is giving authority to Joseph. He wants people to know that Joseph is an authority. He does so much that he actually takes his signet ring off of his hand and puts it onto Joseph's hand. Now that signet ring is very important because when the Pharaoh or a king anywhere would make a proclamation of some sort, they would put a little bit of wax on that proclamation, and then the, 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 the king would take his ring, and he would stamp it onto that, and it had a symbol, and that symbol represented that king. That was a way of saying, this authority is mine, and I'm giving it here to this person. That signet ring would, would, would say, this is the person, this is authority. This is coming from an authoritative source. So when they would see it, they would go, yes, we know we might think of it today as our autograph. Our autographs are all very unique, aren't they? The same basic idea. And then Pharaoh has, has him on his second chariot. And before him, he has a crier calling up, bow the knee, or bow down. Thus he set him over all of Egypt. All of this is, is Pharaoh, in essence, saying, as you treat me, so you should treat Joseph. Then he sets out to turn Joseph into an Egyptian. Well, sort of. He gives him a new name, Zaphonath Paneah. Okay. Now there is some argument about what this name means in in in, uh, in the Egyptian, and really, in the end, we don't know for sure. Okay. They, they try to piece it together with various different things, but we don't know for sure what it means, and it really doesn't play a big part in Joseph's life. So we kind of move past it really quickly. Then he gives him an Egyptian wife, Asenath the daughter of uh, Potipharath, the uh, priest of On. Okay? Now, some people have looked at this and they say, well, wait a minute. Now Joseph is marrying not just an Egyptian woman, but a woman who is the daughter of the priest of Egypt. And actually, this place, On, is also a place known as Heriopolis. And if you know anything about Egyptian culture or Egyptian history, Heriopolis is one of the most important cities in Egypt. So if he is the priest, he was a man of very high standing. And so people ask the question, does this mean that Joseph is compromising his Hebrew identity? Or worse, is he allowing Egyptian idolatry into his life and to his home? I believe that the answer to that is no, as we'll see later. Joseph continues to hold to his Hebrew, to his Jewish identity. However, for Joseph to serve as visor of Egypt as he was here, he needed to fit with the people around him, and the people would need to accept him. So there were certain things that he needed to do for the people to be able to accept him. This also doesn't apply that he worshipped the Egyptian gods. I don't believe he did that either. And as his story unfolds, we'll see more and more indication that he didn't do that at all. In fact, there's no indication that, he, that, that Joseph's Egyptian wife or her father had really any impact on Joseph's life and his belief in the one true God. 
In fact, she doesn't even really play a big part in the rest of the narrative, other than she gives him children. That she's the mother of his children, Manasseh and Ephraim. That's all we really know about her. Later on in history, actually, a, uh, uh, around the first century, uh, somebody wrote a story called Joseph and Asenath. And the, the, the story is about how she came to know the one true God. Now, we don't know if that story is true, and there's every indication to say that it's not true, but it was really the way that, 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 that writers could kind of say, here's how she actually does fit into the narrative. So it was a, a challenge that Hebrews struggled with, but I don't think that there's any reason to actually struggle with. We have no indication from the way that Joseph lives his life or what he proclaims about God for us to think that he was giving in to the foreign gods that were around him. So look at what it says in verse 46. Verse 46, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh, and he went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly. And he gathered up all the food uh, of these seven years, which uh, occurred in the land of Egypt, and put food in the cities. He put every city in uh, the food uh, from the fields around him. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Joseph, just as he said, just as it came true. Joseph said that there would be years of abundance, and indeed that happened. Now think about this for a second. Joseph is now, as I told the kids this morning, the second most powerful man in the world. Greatest power at that time was Egypt. Pharaoh was the greatest power in the world. Joseph goes from being a prisoner to 24 hours later, being the second most powerful man in the world at the young age of 30. Pretty impressive, huh? The land gives an abundance. Notice that Joseph, once again, does exactly what he's asked to do without complaining, without whining. He just gets to work. And God opens up the storehouse of Egyptian through, or Egypt through Joseph. In fact, there's so much that they can't even count how much they have. Imagine that for a second. Sounds like the federal debt, doesn't it? <laughs> Go on to verse 50. It says, Before the year of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, uh, daughter of Potipharia, a priest of On, bore uh, them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for, he said, God has made me forget all of my hardship at all of my father's house. And the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Joseph here is blessed with two sons. These sons become very, very important in Joseph's life. He names both of them in such a way to be reminded about God's provision for him. First of all, Manasseh. As he says, it means uh, that the reason why he names him uh, Manasseh is because God had made him forget all of his hardship and all of his father's house. Now he calls him that because the root in Hebrew of Manasseh is to forget. To forget. And then he names, uh, and, and really think about that for a second. It's kind of fascinating when we think about that because there's no indication up to this point that Joseph is feeling any sort of longing for his homeland or his family, and then he's feeling any sadness over his plight. Yes, when he's in prison, he says he doesn't want to be there anymore, but outside of that, we don't really have any indication that he's longing for his home or that he feels bad about what he's experienced. But here we see, by the name that he gives his firstborn son, that Joseph did have those feelings, that he was struggling throughout much of his life. Remember, he was plucked from his land at the tender age of 17. And ever since then, he's lived as either a slave or a prisoner in Egypt. Now that he has a son, he says, God has made me forget all of the hardship. He's made me forget what I was taken away from. Now, I'll have more to say about that in a second, but let's look at Ephraim. 
Ephraim, Ephraim. He names him Ephraim because uh, he says, For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The root of the Ephraim in Hebrew is to bear fruit. To bear fruit. In spite of his plight, Joseph sees that God has made him fruitful in the land. Notice here that Joseph, despite being outwardly Egyptian, still names his sons Hebrew names. That's why I said earlier that, that, that he's hanging on to his Jewish heritage. Despite the fact that he was 17 when he was taken out of his land, and that he actually wouldn't go back to his homeland except for one time. One more time in his life, and he lives to 110 years old. Only one time will he go back to his homeland, and he only does it long enough to bury his father. For all intents and purposes, most of his life, he lived in Egypt. And most of that life, he lived as an Egyptian, and not only as an Egyptian, as the second most powerful Egyptian in all of the land. That's what Joseph lived, but he still hang out, he still held on to that cultural identity as a Jewish man. Additionally, both Manasseh and Ephraim would receive blessings from Israel, becoming the fathers of nations. Notice that when we look at the twelve tribes of Israel, there's no tribe of Joseph. There's a tribe of Manasseh, and there's a tribe of Ephraim. Joseph's blessing is actually split between the two sons. His tribe consists of those two sons' tribes. Well, let's look at verses 53 uh, through 57, and then we'll come back to these because there's some important points that we need to get here. Look what it says in verse 53. It says, Seven years of plenty occurred in the land of Egypt, uh, but they came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come. As Joseph had said, there was famine in the land, but all of the land of Egypt, was, uh, there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened the storehouse and sold, and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. The famine comes just as Joseph said it would. And its widespread effects not only have effects in Egypt, but it goes beyond just Egypt. But yet Egypt remains prosperous and strong because of the wisdom and spiritual insight of Joseph. Egypt has plenty, not only to maintain their own people, but also so that other people could come to Egypt to buy grain. And we'll see next week, that's exactly what God would use to save Israel. But another blessing we might miss here, if we don't read carefully, is that in that first seven years, Joseph maintains his position as the go-to guy for Pharaoh. Why do I think that's so fascinating? I think that's so fascinating because Pharaoh has already shown that he's an impulsive man. Why do I say he's an impulsive man? Think about this for a second. He has a bad dream. Nobody can tell him what the bad dream's all about. Until the, 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 uh, the, the wine bearer comes and says, Oh, oops, I forgot. There's this guy in prison, this Hebrew guy, he interpreted my dream. Maybe you want to listen to him. Pharaoh's like, all right, bring him out. Brings him out. This guy who's been in prison for the last two years, accused of trying to, uh, to, to uh, force himself on a high official's wife, by the way, which he didn't do, obviously. But he's accused of this. For all Pharaoh knew, that's what he was guilty of. He comes before, he interprets the dream, and what does Pharaoh do? Makes him the second most powerful person in the entire world. That's kind of the acts of an impulsive person. God, though, maintains his position. Even though Pharaoh doesn't seem like somebody who spends a lot of time analyzing his decisions, God maintains that position that he's in. In fact, so much so that Pharaoh doesn't point to himself 
like most leaders do? He says, no, no, go to Joseph. Most leaders have a tendency to take credit for things they didn't do, right? I know, imagine politicians doing that. It would blow your mind. <laughs> Pharaoh doesn't, because he recognizes that Joseph is the one that's wise. Joseph would get the praise of the people, not Pharaoh. Yet Pharaoh can't deny that Joseph is the one who's doing this. Now, of course, what he didn't realize is that it was God behind it all, right? Let's talk about the so what this morning. Joseph was given a gift in Egypt, one he certainly wasn't expecting. But it's not simply his high-ranking position his authority, his wealth, or having a purpose in his life. All of these are part of the gift, but they're not the totality of the gift. Joseph even gains a family and a legacy, but they're still only a part of that gift. The core of the gift is that there are two very unexpected gifts that Joseph receives when he's in Egypt. The gift of forgetting and the gift of fruitfulness. These are both so important that Joseph names his sons after these, so there'll be a continual reminder to him and all who would come later what God had done for him. So I want to consider both this morning. First of all, let's talk about the gift of forgetting. The gift of forgetting. Let's face it, when we all get a certain age, we forget stuff, right? Let's be honest, how many of you have met somebody and 15 minutes later you can't remember their name? Yeah. Amen or oh me? Yeah, 15, right. <laughs> like 15 seconds, right? Right, right? Just this morning, one of my best friends growing up came into the building. Andrew, right here. We had a, three amigos, me, Andrew, and Evan. Throughout school, we were always together. Saw him, and of course I knew him right away. And then I introduced myself to uh, his significant other, and she's like, yeah, I went to your high school too. Oof. <laughs> well. Thank you for the gift of forgetting. <laughs> we forget things, don't we? Yes. We, we're just human beings, we forget things. But that's actually not the kind of forgetting that Joseph is talking about. He's not talking about that kind of forgetting. Look again at what he says in verse 51. Okay? It says, Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God made me forget all my hardship in my father's house. God made Joseph forget about his hardship and the sadness of being forced out of his father's house. But Joseph isn't talking about not remembering. See, what we're talking about there is not remembering. We don't remember stuff. We, 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 we forget things that we don't remember. Joseph didn't remember these things. If Joseph didn't remember these things, he wouldn't need to name his son after forgetting them because he would have forgotten them, right? He wouldn't have remembered them. Clearly, Joseph remembers those things. There's a difference, though. The idea here is that he's not dwelling on something horrible. He's not being forever beaten down by his hardship. He's not always reliving his pain. But he's able to move forward and actually grow and develop in spite of what he experienced. That's the gift of forgiving or forgetting that Joseph has experienced. Joseph's not the same man that he was when he was taken out of that pit in Dothan. Through hardship and through pain, through suffering and through the injustice that he faced, Joseph has been prepared to fulfill the purposes that God has for him in Egypt. He will save many people, and ultimately, he will save his own family. Yes, God has made all of this come about, but it's through his struggles that Joseph has developed the skills that it will take to fulfill what God has him to do there in Egypt. Part of the reason that Joseph can do that is because he's not living in the past hurts that he's experienced. He's forgotten them in the sense that he's put them behind himself 
and now he's moving forward. And that's where this really should hit home with us as well. Like Joseph, you've experienced trials and tribulations in your life, haven't you? Now, you might not have experienced trials and tribulations to the degree that Joseph did, though maybe some of you have faced even worse things than Joseph has. But none of us have experienced all smooth sailing in our life, have we? None of us have. For some, though, we get stuck in those past trials and tribulations. We never move forward. We stay depressed. We get angry. We eventually become bitter. And then we become unproductive. Could be that you were wronged by a person. Could be that you were wronged by a number of people. Maybe you were wronged by an organization. Or maybe any other number of places or people or groups or whatever that could have wronged you. But instead of being like Joseph, forgetting, they constantly remember, constantly dwell on, constantly blame. Constantly look for a sense of justice to be satisfied. You know what the reality is? That very rarely comes. Very rarely comes. And what happens? They end up getting lonely, angry, and having a fairly unfulfilled life. We're going to learn from the example of Joseph is that we need to seek the gift of forgetting. Seek the gift of forgetting. How do we do that? How do we seek the gift of forgetting? Four things I want to mention. First, genuinely pray to God for the gift of forgetting. Genuinely pray to God for the gift of forgetting. You know, the gift of forgetting calls for a heart change. Calls for a mind change and a heart change. And that only can happen when we Come before God and bring it before Him. God, help me to stop dwelling on this. Help me to make peace with this. Help me to move forward. Put people in my life who will encourage me to move forward and not to be stuck in the past. Illuminate the truth of Scripture to my mind and my heart so that I will move forward. Genuinely pray for the gift of forgiveness. Next, Learn the art of forgiveness. Learn the art of forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard, isn't it? Anybody find forgive, forgiving people easy? It's not. Now, some people are easy to forgive. Some aren't. Some we just can't get by. Some people have wronged us in such ways that we can't ever imagine forgiving that person. So when we run into the scriptures where Jesus is calling us to forgive those who have wronged us, we struggle with those. We say, well, how am I supposed to do that? Think if we're really going to learn something about forgiveness, the first thing that we have to understand is what forgiveness is. Forgiveness does not say that what happened to you was right. It doesn't justify what happened to you. It's not saying that it was right. In truth, forgiveness is you giving up your perceived right to get even with the person. To see the person get theirs. And the next step is that you actually wish the best for them. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship is going to go back the way it was before. Sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. I've counseled women in particular who have been abused by men in their life. They can forgive, but that doesn't mean that they can go back. In fact, they shouldn't go back. It's dangerous to go back. But they can learn to forgive it means that they give up their right or their perceived right to get even with that person. And that they can actually wish God's best in that person's life, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be back then. That's part of the art of forgiveness. Next, Embrace grace. It goes right along with forgiveness and the art of forgiveness and the gift of forgetting. So we need to learn a little bit about grace. We need to learn to give people grace. Have people wronged us before? Yeah. Have we wronged people before? Ooh. 
That's where it gets a little bit personal, right? And I thank God for the grace that has been given to me. Not just from Jesus, which is the greatest grace that has ever been bestowed on a person. But I'm also talking about the grace that has been afforded to me by so many others. You ever said something foolish? I speak for a living. I do it here. I do it through announcing. Guess what? I say a lot of words in a week. And I'm guaranteed that at some point I'm going to say something stupid. <laughs> I am. It's, it's going to happen. At a, a time at the baseball game this year, we had a baseball game where uh, I think that the, it was one of the, we hadn't scored for, for like, games after games after games, and then all of a sudden we decided to do it all in one game. And I think that the score at one point was like 20 to 6 in a baseball game. And so I made this comment that, uh, and I said it over the uh, over the microphone, I said I said that, uh, that uh, well, we're here in an SEC football game. Because it looked like an SEC football game, if you know anything about football. My boss was not happy with me. <laughs> and I apologized, and he extended me grace. Sometimes we're just going to say things that are stupid. We're going to do things that are stupid. And we thank God that people are willing to show grace to us. We need to embrace showing grace to others. We want to be reminded about what grace looks like. We just need to think about what Jesus has done. If Jesus has forgiven us much, then we ought to be able to forgive others much. Next, look for ways to be fruitful. Look for ways to be fruitful. That's actually my next point. It has to do with the gift of fruitfulness. Talk about the gift of forgetfulness. Now we're talking about the gift of fruitfulness. Part of the reason that Joseph was able to move beyond his past was that he had important work to do. Think about it. Joseph was sold to Potiphar so that he could what? Work. Joseph ended up in prison, and he started to do what? Work. He was given in the number two position in all of Egypt, and guess what he did? You guessed it. He worked. Joseph was a worker. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to become workaholics. And if we just become workaholics, then we'll forget all of our troubles. That's not my point. The point is this. When we're doing things that are bigger than ourselves particularly when we're looking for ways to minister and care for others, then we're not dwelling on our problems. We're ministering to other people and their needs. See, just because Joseph arrived at this highly exalted position in Egypt, it didn't mean all the work was done. Joseph didn't arrive and go, all right, from now on it's all golf courses and soap operas for me. I made it doesn't work that way. The work had to start. Joseph had vitally important work to do to save the Egyptian people. And then to save many other people. And then to eventually save his own people. But he needed to do the work. At Diana's memorial service yesterday, I spent some time in a text of scripture from Philippians that fits well here. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 22 says this, For to me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. As I said yesterday, Paul finds himself hard-pressed between prison, as he's there in prison, between two desires of his heart. One desire was to continue to fulfill his calling to bring the gospel to as many people as possible. His other desire was to be with Christ in glory. While being with Christ is, in Paul's words, far better, Paul understands that every minute that Christ gave him on earth is an opportunity for fruitful gospel ministry. In fact, earlier in Philippians, Paul says this, verse 12, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. 
And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak.